Hi, I'm Richard Campbell from .NET Rocks and Rhinus Radio here for SSW TV in Sydney at the NDC Sydney conference. Got a little time to do an Ask Me Anything, and I've got Bill Wagner and Bart Desmet with you. And gentlemen, I've known you both for a long time now, but you were not Microsoft employees when I first know you, knew you. Mm -hmm. And Bart, you've been with Microsoft now, I think, more than 10 years. 10 years in October, yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank Don't you, you get like a big bag of M&Ms or something for that? That's what I have to buy. Oh, you have to buy the M&Ms. Yep. And Bill, you're the surprise because yeah. you've been an independent for forever. I mean, the author <laughs> of Effective C Sharp and so forth. But it's only been a, about a year you, you crossed A little over? more than a year. A little about more than a year? 15, 16 months at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, you're deeply into the docs team. Right, so I'm responsible for all the docs related to C Sharp. Our team does C Sharp, VB.NET, F Sharp, .NET Core, .NET Framework. Yeah. And if you haven't seen docs.microsoft.com, like you're missing out. Those are a lovely I, set of tools. You know, I, I love what the site team did in rethinking everything, you know, if you look at MSDN, it was kind of designed to be, we had all these things on paper, now let's put them on the web. Right. It's really designed for the web. Uh, Rob Eisenberg is one of the PMs. Yeah. You know, the Aurelia guys, we get some of that goodness. And, and really thinks through how web presentation should be. And, well, and we're going to talk about Rosalind for sure in right. the conversation around C Sharp, because I think a big piece of what makes Docs super cool is that you can run the code right in place. Like, there's a lot of C Sharp going yes. on under the hoods there. Too. Oh, there's a lot. And um, the other thing that we're doing that you can't see is we're building all of the doc set as part of the build process, so it's all static mm -hmm. by the time you load it. So it's just They're real pages. much faster. It's much faster. Right. Um, and I'll link to all the open source for the docs on GitHub. So. You know, if you find a typo, as you did when I you have done interview it, it you just <laughs> hit the edit button, fix it, submit a PR right there, and uh, in less time it would take to write an issue for us. Less time it takes to record a .NET Rocks, as I recall. That's right. <laughs> it was already merged by one of my teammates when we finished recording. Yeah, while we were still recording. Yeah. And Bart, I'm, I started with Bill because he's only done one thing. You've been all over the company. I mean, you, I think you started in WPF. Yeah, that's right. Back yeah, in yeah. the day. Mm -hmm. And well, who are you with now? Uh, right now I'm in the Bing organization, yeah. They still Working. exist, huh? Yeah, still exist. <laughs> Quite popular in the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so working on event processing, um, logical continuation of the work on Rx, the mm -hmm. web extensions. Yeah, and before that, you know, was in the SQL org, you know, working on Rx related stuff. Yeah, that you know, we forget how important that whole streaming side of the mm -hmm. equation is, mm -hmm. and it, and it's interesting to think about C sharp in that context. Like there's. In my mind, there's a lot of different personalities to C Sharp. The, the RX mm -hmm. personality of C Sharp, I mean, a totally different way of thinking about mm -hmm. Link yep. than, say, circa 2006 mm -hmm. when it mm -hmm. came out with generics. Like, that's yeah. just not the same creature. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's like a mini language in language, mm -hmm. like, you know, which is really easy to repurpose. Like, 3.0 gave us all the mm -hmm. tools, right? Like, yeah. 3.0 gave us Link, but mm -hmm. also, like, lambdas and mm -hmm. kind of the bread and butter of our services expression trees. So like you know, just being able to let the user express their intent in a piece of code that looks like query-like or like fluent interface pattern-like, you know, by just chaining a bunch of operators together. And then on top of that, the icing of the cake, the whole async stuff, like right. where we can really allow people to express their intent in a client API, which is, you know, saying like, I want to process events this way, you know, using those filter conditions, those aggregations, those windowing operations, and then submit it asynchronously into the cloud where it just keeps sitting and, and keeps it, and running. And it's asynchronous, not, not necessarily mm -hmm. parallel processing, mm -hmm. but that's a possibility, but yep. asynchronous, mm -hmm. which is really, mm -hmm. I think all we actually mm -hmm. care about as developers is don't hang, don't yep. wait, yep. do these right. things and make sure you come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's actually one of the interesting distinctions that, that we spend a lot of time trying to get the idea for developers. And Eric Lippert has a great analogy for this for async. You know, if you think of, say, a short order cook, mm -hmm. right? If I'm synchronously doing this, I'm going to, you know, turn on the stove and start melting the butter for the eggs. I'm going to stand there and watch it until it's melted. And then I'm going to go over to the toast and I'm going to put the toast in the toaster and I'm going to stand there and wait until the toast comes up. And then I'll go back and crack the eggs. Now. If, if I were to think of this in parallel, I'd have four people in the kitchen, each one doing something different, right? That's parallel processing. They'll bump into each other, share data, and you know, you got a mess on the floor. Asynchronous means I'm going to turn on the stove, 
while that happens, I'm going to be busy working on the toast or getting the juice out or you know setting the table, and then I'll see, you know, that task is finished, the stove's warm. Now I start cooking the eggs. Right. I can move on. So that's asynchronous. I still may only have one processor, one thing actively executing CPU bound logic, but I'm going to wait until this asynchronous task on another resource comes back and says, "Okay, I'm ready for the next thing." You know, whether that's a network or a disk file or input from a user or something else that's going to come back with an input. You know, async await clearly won. Like this is a tech that folks are using, mm -hmm. they appreciate, uh, and I compare it, although it's an unfair comparison, to something like Task Parallel Library, which mm -hmm. was much more focused on let's use multiple cores in our code, right. Right. that I just don't think people got a lot of value from or ended up not using. Well, I think it depends on what you're building, mm -hmm. right? If you're building something that is heavily CPU bound, that can be split into different pieces, right. TPL is awesome, right? If we're building something that's, say, a network of services running on different machines, I'm, I'm going to be network bound. Right. That's async. Yeah, why tie up cores waiting for returns? Right. Mm -hmm. Where async really just says, just don't tie me up, let me know when stuff arrives. Exactly. Now, I think Reactive is a different creature, and I mm -hmm. think fewer people understand Reactive than the other sort of flavors of coding in C-sharp. Yep. You, mm -hmm. you should write us down, if you don't mm -hmm. mind, Bart, because sure. you know yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, the basics is really like you know, doing event processing, mm -hmm. like, but without clunky event handlers, which are imperative for code, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, know, you want to be able to chain together a set of well-defined query operators, which can be filtering, projection, those kind of things. But as opposed to doing it, what you would typically be doing on top of an enumerable sequence of data, you would be doing it on what we call an observable sequence of data. So you will be doing it on something that abstracts the ability uh, to subscribe to events and then get events pushed to you. And so in a sense, it's the same thing as task of T, but for multiple values. Sure. Like, you know, task of T is the eventual completion of an operation, which may or may not have a value with it, like task versus task of T. In this case, it's let me just attach a continuation to this event source, and then you know, as soon as there's an event, I'll get woken up, and if there's multiple events, I'll get woken up multiple, multiple times. times. And mm -hmm. It's sort of inherently mm -hmm. parallel as well. It's mm -hmm. all in the invocations, yeah. right? As mm -hmm. many invocations there are, they, and it, I kind of like the fact that as developers, like not only do you not have control, you, you don't even know if it ended up on multiple cores. Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. not your problem. Yeah. You don't mm -hmm. have to think about that. Whatever gets invoked is what gets invoked, and under mm -hmm. under the hood, I think the 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 framework and the operating system are deciding how that's actually going to execute. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the case of the Bing service, like we actually implement this event processing system using a lot of TPL work, actually, mm -hmm. because really? what's happening there is you have millions of queries sitting in the same process. They're all effectively compiled expression trees, so like it's link C Sharp 3.0 all over the place, <laughs> effectively. <laughs> but so we just do dynamic compilation of all of that code, and then you end up with thousands of events per second arriving across millions of little standing queries. And so obviously it makes a lot of sense to be able to process those millions of queries in parallel. Because each of those events mm -hmm. are, is effectively immutable. Yep. So they mm -hmm. don't have to be coordinated exactly. with anything else. Mm -hmm. Let them do what they want to do. Yeah, yeah. Totally immutable data structures and then you know, strictly sequential execution mm -hmm. within the streams. Like you can't have the stock tick saying that the stock is down, arrive out of order if the stock is up. Right. Like people are going to make the wrong decisions based on that. But uh, you may have a lot of people that are interested in the same event, and we can totally process their needs completely in parallel. They have their own mutable state, like the events are immutable, mm -hmm. but the computation may have mutable state. Like I want to get the average, I want to get the maximum, the minimum, like, you know, those kind of computations, but each of them has their own state, and it's kind of, you know, a single threaded mm -hmm. illusion, yes. you know, within that same query, but in reality, we multiplex it on top of a bunch of parallel execution uh, capabilities. Well, and I think that's, mm -hmm. again, the same thing that's great with mm -hmm. asynchronous, right, is I don't want a developer having to think about threads. Mm -hmm. I don't think about cores, right. right? I just make these standard statements, these expressions mm -hmm. that I want to have executed. I, they have natural immutable boundaries, so mm -hmm. you know what's going to interact, what isn't going to interact, and after mm -hmm. that, let the machine deal with the complexity. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's simplifying it just a little bit. <laughs> <but> <laughs> well, and, it's, and it is in your best interest to understand a bit more under the hood. Right. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like, 
as soon as you have to start thinking about the plumbing of how stuff executes, mm -hmm. you, you're, A, it's, it's a bear to debug. Uh, and it, you're getting further and further away from the problem you're actually trying to solve. Right, and, and you know, the, it, async is a good example here because if you just do the simple stuff, mm -hmm. your code will always work, mm -hmm. right? Just async and await, everything should return a task or task of T, and you always await those tasks. If you just do those things, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to avoid deadlock right? and some of the live lock and some of the other conditions you might have. You, but you may not necessarily get the fastest code. Okay, and, and configure await and the, um, the context is the biggest part of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have different kinds of threads in Windows, right? If I'm running a Windows UI, I can only have one thread that's going to change things on the screen visibly. Right. So that, that particular thread's special. If I have callbacks that are, you know, things that happen after an await that is going to update the screen, I have to execute that code on the thread that can that update the UI. The UI. Yeah. So now, by default, what we do is we have this um, synchronization context. When you go into an await, the code, the compiler grabs a copy of that context and goes, okay, everything after the await it's going to execute on this context, so it gets queued up, right? So if, if I don't need that, things mm -hmm. may wait to execute longer than they need to. Like let's take an ASP.NET application. Right. The threads come out of the thread pool, they're all the same, there's nothing different. Yeah. One thread pool thread's as good as another. So if I configure a wait false, now I still have that captured synchronization context, but I can just get a thread from anywhere to execute mm -hmm. the continuations. So chances are I get better throughput. Mm -hmm. The danger is in getting that better throughput if you don't understand when I can't execute on a different context, right. then mm -hmm. you can run into deadlock and, and Well, you problems. don't know why you're failing. You thought right. you were doing the same thing, but you've got <laughs> but this UI context. Not. Right, so, so that's kind of where we're trying to make this so that with anything we add in the language, the simple path is absolutely going to work. Right. Mm -hmm. The more difficult path might give you more efficient code if you understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I just wonder about the overhead and all of that. Like if you've got a really simple executing app, are mm -hmm. you paying a price for maintaining those uh, contacts for async and await? That <laughs> in theory then the simplest mm -hmm. path might be just a straight linear execution? Yes, but the compiler does a lot of optimization. Sure. So Bart went into this a lot in his yeah. session mm -hmm. yesterday in mm -hmm. terms of you know, how it's going to do some things where with the state machine that gets built for async and await to jump back into the code where you left and continue. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to await, you don't pay any of those costs, mm -hmm. right? So if by the time you await a task that's already completed, none of those costs get paid. Right. Mm -hmm. If that task is still running, well then you have to await, you have to pay that cost mm -hmm. somehow because the code has to execute correctly. Yeah, you're either waiting or you're letting await do it. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and you it's have to even, it yourself. And yeah. it's even gotten better than C-sharp mm -hmm. 7 with the task likes. So we can actually have async return types, which are not task of T. Mm -hmm. Like any type can be, you know, a task-like type that can be returned out of an async method, provided it implements a certain pattern mm -hmm. that the compiler, you know, emits against, right? right? And so with that, you can even get rid of the allocation cost, the heap allocation cost of the task in case you, for example, return a value task of T. So at that point, people can start, you know, thinking about, you know, are we in a situation where this code is very likely to execute asynchronously, right. and then we need that allocation anyway. Or is it something like we have a lot of things in Bing where we have, you know, async deep down, right? And then it's bubbling up, like it's like an oil spill kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. You have some async at the bottom, and then it needs to be async all the way to the top, right. where you have to commit a crime by doing you know, dot result or dot wait somewhere and sort of like, you know, do the worst thing Sorry, did you call that commit a crime? Commit yes. a crime, yeah. Committing yeah, a crime yeah. with that. So yeah, let's block here, you know, because it's more convenient kind right. of thing, but uh, don't do that. But so, in a lot of cases we have to wrap like APIs that used to be synchronous mm -hmm. to become asynchronous because they need to be used in an asynchronous context. Right. And there may be one implementation of them that's truly async, but a lot of implementations are backed by synchronous, you know, implementations. And so at that point you end up with, you know, ways to, to like improve there by using, for example, value task of T, mm -hmm. which is 
effectively a discriminated union with an OR type, which either contains a result that's already ready, or it contains a task of T, which can be awaited on. And so if the happy part is that the code will run synchronously most of the time, like you can actually start optimizing towards that as well. Right. right. So you have, you have lots of knobs to sort of like get into. Yeah, so right then it just becomes an optional mm -hmm. route. Well, we're right. synchronous. I'm not going to mm -hmm. bother with this task of mm -hmm. T. We'll just give you a value. It, yeah. And the beauty of this is the, the compiler and the language is generated, so you can write some of this yourself if you have special purpose needs. Mm -hmm. But there's a NuGet package with value task of T, as Bart was mm -hmm. talking about, where if you just want to get those performance improvements and you have that kind of situation, just grab the NuGet package with value task and where mm -hmm. you see task or task of T, replace it with value task. Right. And then, you know, a couple API changes underneath inside your asynchronous method and you're there. Mm -hmm. And the one exception to that is the in 7.1 we now have asynchronous main methods mm -hmm. and that has to be a task. Um, okay. The compiler's looking for that. Um, and that, again, just to make people more productive, it's just, this is what I was saying, you have to commit a crime, right? You have to wait <laughs> synchronously. <laughs> well, if you're writing a console app, you have no choice. Yeah. Right. You can start that task, and if main awaits, there's nothing. Yeah, you main, have no control yeah, over that. Yeah. And then your program just exits. Right. Whereas now, I can make an asynchronous main, async task main, or async task of int main, and I can have awaits in there. And the compiler will generate an entry point that goes through the await pattern and, and does the, the evilness for you correctly, mm -hmm. so you don't have to. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of different choices, <coughs> and I wonder for some folks that are watching or here in the audience, it's just like if you haven't explored this side of C sharp, like it's a very different mm -hmm. aspect to, to sort of traditional development or pure straight up old fashioned co uh, web development in C sharp. Mm -hmm. We've we've built a bunch of different personalities for C sharp. It seems now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is you know the Mads. Uh, had a great blog post on this earlier in the year about taking the managed languages and, and what are their personalities, mm -hmm. right? You know, you have C Sharp, which has millions of developers. It's a general purpose language, by and large. It's, its DNA is object-oriented, because yes. that's where it started. But we now have ways to explore functional programming with link or Absolutely. reactive extensions. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at more data separation with things like pattern matching and um, get our only properties, make it a little bit easier to write these immutable data types where there's no behavior then because they're immutable. Right. Um, C Sharp 8 is proposing record types, mm -hmm. you know, which is, again, that separation of data and functionality, very not object-oriented. You have F Sharp, which is a very functional language, but can reach into this object-oriented yes, framework. Yes, it has to be friendly to live with objects to some right. degree. Look mm -hmm. at the world it's living in. And then you have VB, which is a general purpose language and you know we've been talking about how you can kind of control just you know turn different ni dials on C sharp and get better performance with some risk and so on. And VB is all about developer productivity. Right. So the tools come in. You know, tools take more primacy in VB. Right. I want to be able to have UI widgets to tweak different things. I want to be able to configure, drag and drop, and so on. And, the and, and more of a speed visual. of development mm -hmm. mindset. Right. And, and C Sharp is more of that. Mm -hmm. I can, I can control all the things. Right. But it's still I, I want to tweak it at a lower level. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that brief period where we flirted with the DLR. Mm -hmm. And of yes. course, I'm the guy who's pulling all the history notes together mm -hmm. these days. So of course, I'm thinking about that. It's like mm -hmm. that seemed like a, a, a detour in some respects. Another aspect of C Sharp that didn't mm -hmm. really amount to much. Mm -hmm. It's got niche uses. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, there are performance costs because you have to use reflection. Yes. Right? There's no way around yeah, it. Reflection is not free. And, and again, Bart did this really well in his session yesterday. If you were going to try to solve the problems that Dynamic has, mm -hmm. you'd almost certainly write code that's slower than using Dynamic. Mm -hmm. But that's not what you're after. Like, this right. is not about speed. This is about that flexibility yep. that comes mm -hmm. from dynamic behavior. Um, and it does do some really interesting things where, you know, Iron Python, and that community has grown, yeah. so there is interop between C Sharp and Iron Python. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the DLR and Dynamic and C Sharp help there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it didn't definitely take the world by storm. Um, that's probably on the list of C Sharp features that I'd miss a lot less than others. Sure. But it is really handy when I have it. 
mm -hmm. when I really have a need for it. For, the, for, for those particular cases, and, and I'm laughing because we're thinking, you know, we sort of picked this up at C-sharp three when, mm -hmm. when Lambdas and mm -hmm. Link arrived, and now we sort of, we've been talking about seven and even eight, which isn't out right. yet, and kind of ignoring what happened in between, although lots of good happened in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, four was a great version. That yep. was a, a, when the CLR revved again, and mm -hmm. we, had a, we had very tight tooling. Yeah, and then five was huge, mm -hmm. switching to the compiler written in C-sharp. Yeah. Um, which I wonder what that did to the team. Oh, you mm -hmm. can see it already, just with, with six. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, the compiler team's super smart, but when they're spending all day writing C++ code right. to generate C Sharp, mm -hmm. that makes it much harder to come up with ideas going, you know, this language would be cooler if it did this. Right. But now mm -hmm. they're all day writing C Sharp to mm -hmm. generate this code, and it's like, you know, this code's ugly. I wish it looked like this. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to make it look like this. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that routine coding time mm -hmm. in C Sharp mm -hmm. makes you think about the elegance of your C Sharp yes. in a very yeah, different very way much than so. working in C++. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. I don't know if that's a particularly visible thing to folks just out using the tools. So you, you, both of you are mm -hmm. at Microsoft mm -hmm. today, and certainly I've had a very close relationship with them to know the teams well enough to recognize that that was a personality change a few years ago, and we're just yeah. really starting to reap the benefit today. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that you can see, you know, like, if you look at a history of C Sharp, mm -hmm. right? You know, C Sharp 1, we have a language. C Sharp 2, we have generics. C Sharp 3, we have link. Mm -hmm. C Sharp 4, dynamic. Mm -hmm. 5, Rosalind and async and await. And then six, mm -hmm. okay, let's see, there's string interpolation, there's um, exception filters, there's, mm -hmm. I'm gonna miss a bunch of, there's like 10 yeah. You wrote features. a book. Yeah. I know, <laughs> but there's like 10 new features in this version. Sure, yeah. it, it was it, like a Cambrian explosion. Right, right. Yeah. and with all the others, it's like, here's this one big theme, and yeah. all of a sudden it's like, boom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think boom. the only place where, like, you know, that was similar was like C Sharp 3.0 because there was a lot of like distinct features that had to go in yes. to make, to make it happen. like yes. link happen, right. like you know, yeah, lambdas yeah. and and there was only this one <coughs> feature, um, automatic properties, which was not essential to link, but right. sort of sneaked in, right? Yeah. And then in C Sharp 6 was the first only time that it was not just one feature, but like a whole, a whole potpourri of like all sorts of things that yeah. people had on their wish list. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And suddenly C Sharp could live in virtually any context. Certainly now we're seeing it across operating systems, but right. uh, you know, there, there was the script sharp folks, like just mm -hmm. this idea that, well, where would you like to insert this language and have all mm -hmm. those capabilities? I, yeah. I still don't think we've seen all the possibilities there. Mm -hmm. No, well, you know, you look at a project like OmniSharp, Mm -hmm. Right, which provides language analysis using Roslyn in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So these other other editors, whether it's VS Code or Sublime, mm -hmm. they make a service call. You know, here's a string that looks like C sharp. Please bring it back down syntax color, mm -hmm. or marked so I can syntax color it. Mm -hmm. Right, based on your preferences, and that stretches across all these editors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's awesome. Compiler as a service. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even within Visual Studio, right, like with C sharp interactive. Mm -hmm. It's also yep. a great place to, you know, sort of start doing, you know, things and sort of like remembering, like, you know, mm -hmm. what does this API do? Like, you know, and you don't know anymore, and you sort of like don't want to commit to writing the code yet, but you sort of like want to first get a refresh really quickly. Sure, like, it's you know, a command line approach command to line coding in C Sharp again, and yeah. then export that as a file. Yeah. I'll import it into my project, and yeah. that's something mm -hmm. that works. Beats yeah. the heck out of Notepad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. got it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, really fun to chat with you. Certainly, we'll open it up to the floor. If you've got any questions, the microphone over on the side there. So we queue up. We can ask mm -hmm. questions of uh, these two here, and uh, and for anybody watching online, please uh, type your questions in. We'll take them as well, sir. So one question I have, uh, kind of dot net all the general collections, most of them are not thread safe because I guess they were kind of built in a time when the default was to do single threaded and you had to be kind of advanced to go multi-threaded. Now a sync await is making it so easy that almost everyone's going multi-threaded, probably m a lot of people not even realizing they're going multi-threaded, yet still all the basic collections will blow up when you try and access them in a multi-threaded context. Do you think the language's kind of core collections need to kind of be redesigned so that multi-threading is the de default assumption now and that they need to be thread safe? That's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, yeah. I mean, I like the default personally being not thread safe because, you know, if you build something in a thread safe manner, there's always some 
you know, non neg negligible costs, you know, associated with it. Like you sort of always pay the penalty. And in fact, like, you know, even in async and await, um, you're right that execution happens using multiple threads. But, you know, say that in an async method you have a collection and you don't do any synchronization around it, your async code is still running sequentially. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like multiple parts of the async state machine are executing yeah. at the same time and you can have concurrent writes. So it, it implies, unfortunately, that people have to know when they're using things concurrently. But we have pretty good, like, you know, collection types in the system, collections concurrent namespace that actually help yeah. in those kind of cases. So um, I think it's about offering the choice and not picking one default and then penalizing people that happen to need the other default. Yeah, I would, de I would definitely agree with that. I think it's, in, and having thread safe collections is only one part of thread safe programming. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, I think it would be a mistake to imply to programmers that just use C Sharp and your code is thread safe, right? So, or C Sharp in the .NET libraries. So I think it's, it, it is important to go, we're gonna do this for the single threaded case and it's your shared data, it's your responsibility to guard mm -hmm. that appropriately. And, and unfortunately that is hard. There's no good yeah. answer there, it, it is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think over what the, what it would look like to be in a completely thread safe, multi-threaded mode in mm -hmm. studio with their, all that stuff turned on, not just what the overhead would be, but mm -hmm. it's a bunch of things, like, because it is somewhat a different coding style mm -hmm. as well. At that point, you almost make everything immutable. Yes, right? you know. which almost, I feel like you want to jump out of that language then, like that seems mm -hmm. more yeah. F-sharpy to me, right. where right. immutable yep. by default is the bigger metaphor, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. than thread safe by default. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's like a single thing being thread safe doesn't compose at all. No. You, know, you may have you know one thing being thread safe, but then the next thing you have is you need to update two collections at the same time. And so at that point, you know, it doesn't really help for the defaults to be different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and if you think of the, like the classic problem there is transferring money from one bank account to another, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Two different services. Two different services, two mm -hmm. different things. It either has to all happen or not all mm -hmm. happen mm -hmm. and so on, yeah. Yeah, I just think the, the metaphor, the modern multi-threaded metaphor is the mutability metaphor more mm -hmm. than it is the thread yep. safety metaphor, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there's nobody else with the microphone, I'll, what's that? Can we get him a mug? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was, I did a talk one time where I handed out ice cream bars for okay. a good question too. So you're up for an ice cream bar, I just don't actually have any, but yes. minor detail. Do you have any questions from the online audience? Nope, that's great. Mm -hmm. Guys, thanks wait, so wait, much wait, for- uh, there. Oh, oh, we have Sir, one. please, to the microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about your vision, actually. Two type of uh, things just I have seen in the uh, in this conference. Uh, first one was the Razor pages in ASP Core. Uh, that looks like uh, implementing MVVM in ASP Core. So uh, I don't feel great about that. I have no problem with the with the pattern, but that looks like a MVC and WinForm again and that too is cool of tout. Uh, I would like to hear from you, how do you think about that? And is it good or oh, that might be not that much great? And the second question is about the future of C Sharp. Functional programming is getting hotter and hotter. Mm -hmm. In every meetup, people talking about functional programming. How much I, as a C Sharp developer, should spend on the top of that? it's going to take the place of C-sharp, or mm -hmm. C-sharp still has a job for me in the market. Hmm. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Should we, I think the Razor page one might uh, be a little easier, although that's, I, I don't know that either of you are big on web development. Yeah, I honestly don't know much about Razor pages, so I can't answer that. Um, that would have been a fantastic question for Damien when he was here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, ha I, mm -hmm. I got nothing, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah same here. Um, but it, to address the second part here, F Sharp's going to take the day, right? We're all going to be mm -hmm. functional programmers, and C Sharp will be relegated to the dustbin. I don't think so. I think oh, both. No, come well, on, Bill. No, I think both. <laughs> I, I, I think both are going to be valid. Mm -hmm. um, so here's here's 
in my mind, a very interesting history on this. If you go back to a lot of institutions teaching computer science in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s and 80s, there were really two schools of thought on it. There was one that was very functional oriented, started with math, Lisp, things like this, and built very mathematical expression model type functional programs. And there was this other school that went, that stuff doesn't run on today's hardware. Let's actually build something that works on the machines we have because of the speed of machines in the 50s and 60s. You know, We're talking much larger scale chips, much slower clock speeds and all that kind of thing. And much more expensive memory. And so functional programming started to really take off once hardware catches up to the point where I can do functional programs and they don't just blow up on any real hardware I have. But we're also seeing things get much smaller. If you look at IoT, phones are still a constrained device, even if larger than laptops four or five generations ago. And imperative programming is still going to happen. Um, I think both are going to be used in a lot of different ways. Uh, we're in a really interesting space where I think both models work, and the hybrid languages I think are most interesting, where F Sharp being one where mm -hmm. it can do object oriented or procedurally oriented stuff. Its DNA and its base is in functional. And I've seen some very functional yeah. C Sharp too. I mean, right, you can right. choose to have the discipline around coding in C-sharp that comes across very functional. But it's a little less natural. It is. Right? You're, you're you fighting know. against its tendency to mutability. Right, mm -hmm. right. And its tendency to think in terms of objects and mm -hmm. classes and structures and, and sort so of on. Share that shared memory right. mindset, that's what made object orientation more efficient in right. earlier hardware and in small hardware today. Exactly. Where you tend to execute on the same piece of memory over and over again, which is mm -hmm. why you need mutexes if you yep. actually go to multiple threads. And you're barely better off not going to multiple threads, staying on a single path of execution on a shared piece of memory. You know, in languages like C, C++, they're still in use in a lot of places today. Those markets haven't really shrunk much. It feels like they shrunk because our industry is so much bigger than it was, you know, 30 years ago. Um, so I don't think, I think it's a, a, a task of the C-sharp language design team to keep C-sharp relevant without making it very, very bloated. You know, it would be easy to just keep adding new features and without thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think they're trying to be really smart about adding features that provide a lot of value. Mm -hmm. Do you think open sourcing C Sharp helped that cause of avoiding bloat or sort of saying focused on what is it that we want this product to be? Um, I think it helps m be more sure of the decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, if you go to the github, uh, github.com slash dot net slash C Sharp Lang, is language design discussions. So right. the language design meeting notes are there. There are proposals for any of the new features and discussions. Mm -hmm. And instead of the language design team, which is a small group but very smart people, you're now getting a lot of feedback from the community. So a much wider audience weighs in on the features mm -hmm. before some of the decisions on what ships and what doesn't. I mean, I like made. that you see those decisions being made mm -hmm. very much in public. I mean, yes. not as public mm -hmm. as say, the ASP team who literally streams them having those conversations. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the Lang team tends to publish after the fact. But you, right. if you want to read it, yeah. you see the discussions. They're they there. Do. And mm -hmm. the only thing that the language design team has made a decision is they don't publish comments by name. Right. I mean, not from the meeting notes. Um, not to, you know, whose feature arguing for one or the other, but then mm -hmm. the team kind of speaks with one voice as to what they decide sure. at the end. And, and still is allowed to have a debate. It's just right. that you don't pick sides per se. It was a debate. Right. Mm -hmm. now, I, I appreciate that approach to it. I think it's been mm -hmm. a challenge for the team doing that too, because, you know, you, both of you have been around the C Sharp team long enough to know that is a very tight knit group of people who have a ton of respect for each other. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And I don't know that that comes across well in the written word near as much as watching them talk to each other. <laughs> They're good to each other while challenging, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and a ton of respect, really brilliant mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think we're in a good place. I, I also like the idea that, that we can back away from a feature that you no longer are on this mindset of, we release when there's this logical thing to release versus meeting mm -hmm. an, a corporate annual report cycle of right. some mm -hmm. kind, you know, that uh, being in the community changes that dynamic. You know, mm -hmm. and, and you can see this, you know, the private protected oh, yeah. 
got pulled a couple times. And mm -hmm. it was a super simple feature to implement. Right. No one liked the syntax. <laughs> but no one found any better syntax yes. for mm -hmm. that particular feature. So better to not do it mm -hmm. than to yeah. do it and poorly. Yeah, going, well, you know, if we can come mm -hmm. up with something, okay. Mm -hmm. And go back yeah. around again. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that we can see that. Because it, mm -hmm. if it was done behind closed doors and presented mm -hmm. as, okay, we're not doing it again, it would look very different than the way you right. see it yeah. from the right. debate. So yeah, I definitely and think we're also, better than that. It's also enabled to point releases, right? Like you know, the mm -hmm. fact that we have yeah. 7.1 and right. so forth. Mm -hmm. Like in the past, it would always have to be something major or nothing. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. now it's possible to also like, you know, have, you know, what's ready can go in. Yeah. Can get prototyped mm -hmm. much, much quicker. And you can choose to pick it up as a developer right. or not. Mm -hmm. Right. right? And well, and you can, e because you can specify what language version you compile against, mm -hmm. there's now a, separate decision between upgrading your tools and using the new language features. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can upgrade the tools, take the next update, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and store the new .NET Core SDK and so on. Don't change that language version flag and you're still on 7.0, mm -hmm. which is the default behavior, right? So everybody who got Visual Studio 2017 V15.3 or .NET Core 2.0 has a compiler that will do the 7.1 features. But every project they already had and even new ones that they create is going to target 7.0 right. unless they explicitly change it. Interesting. Right, so that's that's in your control. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that separation. It lets us keep grabbing things and you mm -hmm. can try it when you're ready. And getting you go forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, Bart, thank you so much for, uh, for spending some time with me. It was really thank fun. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of SSW TV. We hope to see you again.